I'll hit record and you're on, Derek. All right, sounds good. Thank you very much, Gary. And thank you everyone for joining. Uh, my name is Derek Perry. I work in the Bourbon Fisheries Program in New Bedford. I'm also the Massachusetts representative on the Horse Crab Technical Committee for ASMFC. There's a couple of reasons I wanted to give this talk today. One is because this is a pretty interesting animal. There's a pretty interesting fishery around it. Imagine if you had a cod fishery where you could flay the fish, release them, and 85% survived. That's kind of what happens in the biomedical horseshoe crab fishery. The crabs are brought in, they're bled, they're released in the wild again, and about 85% survive. It's kind of an interesting fishery that occurs for these guys. The other reason I want to give this talk is because there's a lot of misinformation about horseshoe crabs. If you Google horseshoe crabs, you'll see a lot of news articles like these here where they're facing extinction or they're being bled dry or this crab's a reason you're alive. All really dramatic stuff and it's just not true. And I'll get into that reasons why soon. Uh, so we have one species of horseshoe crabs in the United States. The range there is in red, it's Limulus polyphemus. There are three more species in Asia. Uh, they're considered a living fossil because they've been around for 350 to 450 million years. They're around long before the dinosaurs and they're here long after. They're marine chelicerate, which means they're more closely related to spiders, scorpions, and ticks than they are to true crabs. They live for about 30 years of age and reach maturity fairly late. Males reach maturity around nine years of age, females around 11. And there's fairly limited dispersal, so they don't go very far once those eggs hatch. Uh, there is a terminal molt. Uh, males, once they reach maturity, will have a leg like this. This is used to hold on to the female, kind of looks like a boxing glove, whereas the female's legs are pretty consistent throughout here, all look the same. Uh, when a male's immature, he'll have legs just like the female does. So it's hard to tell them apart when they're immature, but you can still tell them apart. If you look down here at the general pores, this is a female here, kind of looks like an eye with an eyelid to me. This is where the eggs come out. The male has a stock appendage. So even when he's immature, you can still tell an immature male from a, from a female. Uh, the eggs hatch uh, in about two to four weeks after being laid. Uh, the, the nests are usually laid in May and June. Uh, there is some evidence that they can overwinter the eggs and come out the next spring, but for the most part, they hatch in two to four weeks. When they do hatch, they look like little miniature horseshoe crabs without a tail. Uh, they'll molt a number of times in their first few years of life. This one's molting right here. Uh, there's very high mortality at these, these stages, very low mortality at these stages here. Uh, once you reach about four years of age, they'll molt once per year. I can tell this is a molt here because there's a slit here in the prosoma. This is where the soft crab walked right out of the hard, out of the hard shell. Um, this usually occurs in late summer or early fall. Um, oftentimes we get a lot of phone calls during that period of time about all kinds of horse crabs dead on the beach. That's usually not the case. Uh, then these guys reach maturity, like I said before, around nine to 11 years of age. This one's newly mature. Uh, he has a really uh, tannish shell. This one's an older crab. It has a dark shell. Some of the outer shells sloughed away. It has some barnacles growing on it, so you can tell it's a bit older. A uh, lot, most of the literature says they spawn at high tide during the noon full moons, uh, right at the high tide line. That's not always the case. Uh, we see some at Swift Beach where we do spawning surveys about knee deep water. Uh, they'll spawn in areas that get drained at low tide, but they don't necessarily have to be at high tide. And it's not always on the moons either when they're spawning. And they have a higher mortality rate, natural mortality rate at this, uh, at this, at this stage too, because when they come up to, onto the beach to spawn, a lot of times they get flipped over and they'll desiccate or, or die on the beaches because they can't flip themselves back over after spawning. So very low, low mortality rates here, very high mortality, natural mortality rates there. Uh, this is an instance in Mashpee where a number of crabs wash up on the beach. These are all molts. Uh, often at this time of year, I get a lot of calls saying there's tons of dead crabs. Uh, if you see something like this, it's most likely molts. They're fairly light. So when the waves and winds push these things ashore, they all accumulate in certain spots. Uh, so this is a fairly common occurrence these days, which is a, a good sign. Uh, they're a direct competitor for resources with people. They eat a lot of shellfish, especially soft shelled shellfish, like soft shell clams, mussels and razor clams. They also eat some worms. Because they're in competition for resources with people, there was a bounty on these guys in the 1960s, and that was provided by the state. Uh, the town of Chatham participated in that program, and they killed over 50,000 crabs in one year. That represents about a third of our state quota these days. And it should be noted they killed both horseshoe crabs and conchs, which are both the subject of valuable commercial fisheries these days. Uh, 1962 this is from a report from Duxbury. Uh, they paid four cents to people to kill crabs, and they killed 14,000 that year. And then as recently as 1998, the town of Yarmouth in their shellfish regulations said that you should kill horseshoe crabs and these other predators of shellfish. Uh, Yarmouth was not alone. There was another number of other towns that did the same thing. And this was encouraged at one point by the state. Uh, not quite this recently, though. 
It just took a while to remove that from the regulations. Uh, they have a number of predators, especially the younger sizes, uh, things like crane gone shrimp and blue crabs and other crabs will eat them. As they get older, they have fewer enemies. Uh, smooth dogfish, tiger sharks will eat them, turtles, and even other crabs. Uh, larger juvenile crabs will eat smaller, softer juvenile horseshoe crabs. There is some cannibalism there. Uh, no talk about horseshoe crabs is complete while talking about red knots. You can see a red knot here. This is an endangered species. It's threatened under the Endangered Species Act. Uh, horseshoe crab eggs are very valuable to them. Uh, these are horseshoe crab's eggs here. They don't eat the viable eggs. What they do eat are eggs that have been disturbed by waves or other horseshoe crabs that are building new nests and unearth other eggs. So these guys go along the shoreline and eat the, uh, eat the eggs that are non-viable and are just kind of drifting along the shoreline. Uh, they spend about 50% about of the population of red knots will, winter, or will stop by in Delaware Bay. They'll travel as far from the south as Terra del Fuego, at the southern point of South America, on the way up to the breeding grounds in the Arctic. They'll spend about two weeks in Delaware Bay where they eat mostly uh, horseshoe crab eggs. They do eat a number of things the rest of the time of the year, but during that two week stop, they're eating mostly horseshoe crab eggs. Uh, they'll travel over 20,000 miles round trip in one year, and they'll double their weight during that stopover. Uh, the Delaware Bay harvest of horseshoe crabs is tied to the counts of red knots. If there's few red knots in Delaware Bay, uh, there's fewer crabs that can be harvested in that area. And collectively, all shorebirds in Delaware Bay are estimated to eat 500 tons of horseshoe crab eggs per year. Because horseshoe crabs have been for, around for a long time, there's been a lot of attention and research in these guys, because whatever they're doing, it's working. Um, there's been some research on their eyes, which have shown, um, it's helped people understand how people see light and color better. Uh, that's resulted in a, a Nobel Prize for those researchers. Other researchers look at their immune system. So there's a product called LAL, or Luminous Amoebocyte Lysate, which is a product that's used to test for gram-negative bacteria. And it came about from these guys here. This research was done on Cape Cod in Woods Hole at the Marine, Marine Biological Labs. Uh, this guy Fred, right here, Fred Bang, had noticed that the horse crab blood would, cl would clot when it came into contact with gram-negative bacteria, but they couldn't figure out the mechanism of why that happened. So he recruited the help of Jack Levin, who was another researcher at MBL. He was a hematologist. And they were able to come up with a reason why the blood clotted when it came in contact with gram-negative bacteria. And it was a type of cell that the horse crabs have, an amoebocyte cell. Uh, it's, it's used by the crabs to find uh, bacteria in their, in their systems and expel it. So they developed a system. They did not patent it though. The patent went to somebody else who came around later and patented their system and, and made a lot of money off of it. What that, what that product does is it tests for bacteria, bacteria or gram negative bacteria in particular, things like E. coli, Salmonella, Vibrio. And if those things come in contact with the human blood system or your pet's blood system, it usually causes a fever, can cause sepsis, meningitis, pneumonia, infections, and in extreme cases, even death. You can see over here, this person here has a bunch of horse crabs in the rack. Uh, there, there's a hinge along the seam here. In the middle of that hinge is, a, is a, a membrane. Behind that membrane is a sinus. Inside that sinus is their heart. So what she's doing, she's sticking a needle in here and she's gonna, she's gonna drain about 30% of the blood. It's gonna go into one of these glass tubes here. So these glass tubes here have already spun out. They've been put in a centrifuge and the white cells here, these amoebocyte cells have been separated from the plasma. This plasma gets poured off and these cells, cells here are lysed and the solution inside those cells is what's used to produce LAL, the luminous amoebocyte lysate. So the LAL test is used to test for bacteria in various products like vaccines, including the COVID-19 vaccine, which is why it's been in the news quite a bit lately. Uh, the flu vaccines, many other vaccines, insulin, intravenous solutions, pacemakers, joint replacements, drugs, so many things. So basically anything that goes into contact with your blood system or even the, the handling of the, of the product. So say cases or um, anything that those, those products go into, those have to be tested as well. There's five different companies that bleed horseshoe crabs in the United States. These are the five here. We have one in the Northeast, it's Associates of Cape Cod. They were the first ones to come up with this product. Uh, it started in the 1970s. And there's a few others here. There's also some companies in Asia that bleed Asian horseshoe crabs and make a similar product for the same purpose. So ASMC has some BMPs, best management practices, where they suggest how crabs should be handled by the biomedical firms. These are mostly developed by the biomedical firms themselves. Massachusetts DMF takes those uh, BMPs and makes some requirements of the letter of authorization that's issued to ACC, which is our local biomedical firm. It's issued to them every year. In that LOA, it's, it's said that the crabs have to be separated by source. So there's different sources of crabs that they bring in. Some are provided by biomedical um, suppliers. 
those crabs have to go back to the ocean or at least alive. There's also some that are part of our rent-a-crab program. That rent-a-crab program can take crabs that are destined for the bait market. They can be sent to the biomedical firm, bled, and then sent back to the bait dealer. It's more of an efficient use of a resource. Uh, the crabs have to be returned in good condition if they're going back to the ocean, and they're marked to avoid rebleeding. So every year, Social Cape Cod sends me a picture of the mark they're using that particular year, and the fishermen, when they're harvesting those crabs, will not take those crabs if, they're, if they have that mark. Uh, the crabs have to be transported in 56 degrees Fahrenheit, less than 70 degrees in the lab, and the containers, usually these barrels here, have to be less than two-thirds full. So usually the mark is less than the handle right there. Uh, crabs have to be kept moist with either burlap or some kind of spritzing of water. And mass DMF or the environmental police can inspect the facility at any time. Um, the crabs uh, must be reported by ACC, the number of crabs they bled by sex and the condition of those crabs. I can see here the blood down here. It's a blue blood. It's, it's copper based as opposed to our blood, which is, is uh, iron based. This person here is Jay Harrington. He's been collecting crabs for ACC for about 40 years now in the same spot. There have been a number of studies looking at biomedical mortality. There is some mortality associated with this process. It's about 15%. Uh, there's a range here from about seven and a half up to 30. Uh, some of these papers on this side don't adhere to those BMPs I showed you earlier. Uh, so they're a little bit higher. Uh, this one here actually did a couple of different, uh, different tests. One, they adhered to the BMPs and one they did not. The one where they adhered to the BMPs, their estimates were on this side, but if they did not adhere to the BMPs, if they exposed them to heat, if they kept them out of the water longer, if they drew more of the blood than the, the uh, biomedical firms bleed, then they had a 30% mortality rate. So it kind of depends on what you do to those crabs. If you treat them well, it's more towards this side. So ASMC uses a 50% mortality rate plus the observed. So when the biomedical firms come in and start bleeding the crabs, sometimes there's already dead crabs before they even bleed them. So those crabs that are already found dead are added on to that 15%. Uh, that 50% is based on literature, models, and tagging data. There are some sublethal effects that are possible, but they're poorly understood because some of those studies that did those, these studies here did not adhere to the BMPs. They exposed them to heat, they kept them all over for like five days and went way beyond the standards what the biomedical firms use. Um, so there are alternatives to, to LAL. Uh, one is a rabbit test. LAL actually replaced the rabbit test. What they would do is they would take a sample from whatever, whatever they were testing and inject it into the ear of a rabbit. And if the rabbit developed a fever, they threw the sample away or threw the, st the, st the uh, stock away. There's also monocyte activation test or MAT that's made from human blood. There's also RFC, which is a synthetic version of LAL. It's used in Europe and can be used in the United States, but it's not approved for sole use. So basically what that means is you can use it in the United States, but after you test your product with RFC, you still have to use MAT, the rabbit test or LAL to prove that this works. It hasn't been officially approved in the United States on its own. Uh, there are some companies that are looking at ranching of horseshoe crabs instead of taking wild stock, places like Kepley Biosystem, which is a research institute. Uh, they're taking crabs and looking to outfit them with catheters and basis, uh, draw the blood whenever they want and to, instead of taking them from wild stocks. And places like ACC and Rutgers are looking at population enhancement and taking crabs and raising them out to less than a year usually and then releasing them. So one of the things we do at DMF is we look at uh, biomedical market sampling. We go into the biomedical firm and measure the crabs. They have a terminal molt, so you usually think that they're going to be kind of a, a set standard size. This median size here is fairly consistent, not so bad. This, this blue line here is a minimum legal size of seven inches, and this is a prosomal width, which is the widest point of the shell. Uh, males are fairly consistent too. So I can't show you uh, the mortality based on the biomedical firms for our state because it's confidential because there's only one firm. What I can show you is a coast-wide biomedical bleeding. These are all the crabs here in light blue that are bled for biomedical only. So it's usually like half a million crabs or so. And then down here in the dark blue is the SP mortality. It is much, much less than the bait mortality here. So this is coast-wide bait landings. They're used for bait for conch or whelk, as well as eels, mostly whelk in our state. You can see basically at some points in time, it's been over two and a half million crabs have been, have been used for bait. These are, all, and these are all dead crabs. And then about a million through this period here. So you can see the biomedical firms are using a lot less and the mortality is a lot less than the bait market. But if you look at what's in the papers and in the media, it's all about how the biomedical firms are bleeding all the crabs dry and they're the source of the extinction and all that good stuff. But it's really, it's not true. 
There's two different fisheries for horseshoe crabs. Uh, one is a hand harvest. This is done in May and June during the spawning season. You don't need to invest much to participate in this fishery. Basically, you need is a skiff and some waders. Um, the other fishery is the mobile gear fishery. At one point in time, most of the harvest was done by hand. Now it's actually slightly more mobile gear fishery. They're mostly caught as bycatch in the fluke and squid fisheries. Uh, in 2019, which is the most recent year with complete harvest data, there was 231 bait permits issued. 65 of those were active. It was worth about $330,000. And on average, guys made about five grand per, per person. So it's not a ton of money. These guys aren't getting rich by this. It's basically a supplemental fishery or something to do on the side. Uh, for biomedical, there was 14 permits issued in 2019, and five of those were active. So it's not a huge number of guys participating in that fishery. Uh, these are the landings for bait. Uh, since 2010, it's basically been increasing. We exceeded our quota in 2019. We're pretty close to it in 2018 and 2020. So it has been on the rise. This is where our landings come from. Uh, most of it comes from Nantucket Sound, almost 90%. Uh, about 6.1 comes from Cape Cod Bay all the way up to the New Hampshire border. About 2.5 comes from Buzzes Bay and 1.3 from Vineyard Sound. Look at the seasonality. Uh, we don't see much in January, February, or March. We do see quite a bit more in May, June, and July. Uh, this is the year where the, har the quota was filled, so we didn't see anything after September, but usually we do. Uh, this is a percentage of catch by gear type. This is for mobile gear. You can see outside the spawning season, which is May and June, pretty much all the harvest is mobile gear. During this period of time, it's mostly all hand harvest. So we do some market sampling for the bait markets too. And you can see here, this is an estimated size of maturity. This is from a study done in New Jersey. Uh, but basically it's the closest estimate we have to here. We don't have an estimate for this area here. But what you see is this, this time period here, most of the crowds are above the size of maturity, whereas now we're seeing most of them below. So I was looking into why that was. And basically what I noticed was that during this period of time, there were no samples taken from outside the spawning beach season, May and June. That's, at that point in time, that's when most of the crabs are coming in. Uh, there was a couple instances where they were caught, sampled in, in late summer. This was one instance here. And one sample was taken July here. Everything else from this period was taken from May and June. But from this period on, we're sampling a wider size, a wider season rather. So we're starting in April and going through October. And so I think that's why we're seeing that decline. Uh, the males are pretty stable here. So looking at it by month, you can see that decline over time. This is when it's mostly all hand harvest. And this is when the mobile gear fishery is coming in. And basically the prosoma width, the widest point of the crab drops about an inch. But male size has been fairly consistent. It drops a little bit down here. So there's a number of things the industry is trying to do to reduce the number of horseshoe crabs they're using. One is bait diversification. Uh, part of that's just due to cost. There's a lot of things that can be used as alternatives, such as green crabs or mussels that are really cheap. So guys are using a medley now of horseshoe crabs, green crabs, mussels, or whatever else they can get, and using a medley for that. They're also using bait reducers, things like bait cups or bait bags, to reduce some of crabs and other things they're using. There's been some artificial bait trials. ASMC has been participating in those, and we've helped with that as well. Uh, we've distributed surveys for that and tried to facilitate bait trials. Those artificial baits so far have been pretty ineffective. Uh, we're also trying to collect some maturity data. Uh, looking at spawning beach data. So we're going out on the spawning beaches, uh, mapping where they're spawning and also collecting data. Right now we have a seven inch millimeter size, but I personally don't think I've ever seen a female crab around seven inches mating south of Cape Cod. So we're trying to look at that right now. ASMFC gives us a quota of 330,000 crabs. Massachusetts voluntarily took that and cut it in half to 165,000 crabs. Even still, we have a fair number of crabs here compared to most states. So this is the quota that we have. Uh, there are permit restrictions. If you want a hand harvest bait permit, you can't get one. Uh, there's also a rented crab program where guys can take the crabs from the bait market, send them to ACC, the biomedical firm. They can be bled and sent back to the, the bait dealers. Biomed harvesters have a 1,000 crab daily limit. Uh, for hand harvest, it's 400 crabs. The mobile gear fishery has the 300 crab limit. Uh, that was reduced from 400 crabs by, at the request of the mobile gear fishery. Uh, they were concerned about guys going out and trying to catch more bycatch species and discarding fluke after their fluke quota was filled. So they voluntarily took that cut and limited the amount of horseshoe crabs and conch they can catch as bycatch. Without a permit, you can have six horseshoe crabs. There's a seven inch minimum legal size and you can't bait lobster pots with horseshoe crabs because guys, we were concerned about guys baiting those pots to circumvent their 
conch pot limits. You also can't import Asian horseshoe crabs to prevent diseases and other things from coming into our, our species. There's also closed areas. The area in green, area in blue are federal closures. This area here in red is closed to bait harvest. It's only open to biomedical, that's a state closure. Uh, this area has been harvested for biomedical for about 40 years now. There's also lunar closures. These areas in yellow here, these are five day periods around the new and full moons from the middle of April through the end of June where you cannot harvest horseshoe crabs. This gives them a chance to go up on the beach, spawn and lay their eggs before being harvested. Uh, during the month of June, there's also no fishing days for mobile gear on Fridays and Saturdays. So there's quite a lot of few regulations that ensure the crabs can get on the beach and, and lay their eggs. Aside from the fishery, there's other population concerns. One is eutrophication. Uh, a lot of the south-facing beaches on the Cape or south uh, salt ponds on the Cape have issues with eutrophication where there's these, these dense algal mats that are forming. And basically the, the juvenile crabs and adult crabs can't forage here because there's just these dense algal mats that are forming. There's also a sea level rise. There's beach walls and jetties that really inhibit where crabs can spawn and lay their eggs. Another thing we're seeing is beach grooming. Uh, this is something we see at the beach that we survey in Wareham, where they'll come in at low tide, rake the beach, and basically going right over the spots where the horse crabs have laid their eggs at high tide, disturbing all those eggs and basically wiping them out. Uh, another thing is dredging. Horseshoe crabs use channels to overwinter and to stage for spawning. And these are the type of areas that being, are, are dredged, so you can be disturbing horseshoe crab habitat when you're dredging. Uh, going back to the misinformation, uh, these are quotes from local papers. Uh, the town of Plymouth has an endangered species today. In 2018, that endangered species was a horseshoe crab. Uh, these are from two different articles that we're talking about that day. Uh, horseshoe crabs are not endangered. Uh, a couple of years ago, I went to the Woods Hole Science Troll, and there was a, a group there displaying a touch tank that had horseshoe crabs. And the scientist there was talking about how horseshoe crabs are endangered. Horseshoe crabs are not endangered. Uh, candidate species are reviewed by US Fish and Wildlife and NIMFS to be listed as an endangered species. Horseshoe crabs have never been listed. Uh, the IUCN does list Limnus polyphemus, which is our horseshoe crab, as vulnerable. That's based in the late stage of maturity and some, some of the older stock assessments have showed a decline in certain areas. One of the Asian species is listed as, as endangered by the IUCN. So the last stock assessment was done in 2019. Uh, for the New England region, we were considered neutral. We were grouped with Rhode Island, uh, Mass, New Hampshire, and Maine. But basically the amount of data we had from north of Cape Cod was pretty poor. So that area was kind of chopped off. It was basically just Southern New England or Southern Mass rather in Rhode Island. The Rhode Island surveys are showing a decline. Our surveys are showing an increase. Uh, so that's where we get the one or two here. It's basically kind of a stoplight approach here where green is good, yellow is neutral, and red is bad. And basically what you have here is a region here in New York, which is New York and Connecticut, where four out of four surveys are doing poorly. And then you have that one out of one survey in Rhode Island where it's doing poorly. So basically five of the seven surveys that are doing poorly are in that one little stretch of, of, of land. Everywhere else seems to be doing okay. Um, biomedical mortality was used for the first time uh, because there's only so many biomedical firms, there's confidentiality restrictions for those, but basically they use kind of a black box type approach where the committee and the reviewers were able to see the data, but no one else can really see it. Uh, the 50% was approved. Was approved. Uh, they considered biomedical mortality to be very modest, especially in comparison to the bait and discard mortality. They consider that discard mortality was actually greater than biomed and bait harvest combined. But there was a lot of uncertainty based on that estimate of disco mortality, which is one of the reasons why this next assessment in 2024 is another benchmark assessment. Uh, based on the results of this, this assessment, New York and Connecticut put in new regulations. They're putting in lunar closures and some other measures. So moving on to the surveys that we do, uh, this is from the Mass DMF trawl survey. Uh, this figure is put together by, by Vin Manfredi. You see most of our crabs are down here, south of Cape Cod, especially over towards Chatham. You see some in Cape Cod Bay from Wellfleet over to Barnstable, but most of our crabs are in shallow water, less than 60 feet of water. We don't see many in deep water at all. We don't see that many north of Cape Cod either. And these are the indices, uh, females, males, spring, fall. They're doing really well in the spring compared to historical values. Uh, it's gone way up recently. And fall is also going up, but more modestly. And of course that survey did not occur last year. This is from the Gulf of Maine. That last one is Southern England. This one's Gulf of Maine. Again, we're seeing that big increase in the spring. This is a survey where we often see a lot of zero toes or zero surveys here, which is why it was not used in the assessment. Uh, we're also seeing an increase here in the fall in both males and females. 
We also have a spawning beach survey. We have 17 different beaches that we, we survey. Uh, the ones here in black were not done in 2020 because of COVID-19. Uh, there's still a fair number of beaches that were done. These are all done by volunteer organizations, uh, except for the one down here, number 17, which is done by us over at Swift Beach. We're very dependent on those volunteers to do these surveys. Uh, it's also worth noting that we are not required to do these surveys. The, the states around Delaware Bay are. Uh, Delaware does 13 surveys. Uh, New, Jersey does, New Jersey does 11. Maryland does five. So we do more than all those other states, even though we're not required to do them. Thankful, thankfully for the, these uh, volunteers who make this possible. The survey is based on a survey down in Delaware Bay. There's a lot more crabs down in Delaware Bay. Uh, they have a one square meter quadrat. And the, the problem they, they have down there is they often have to unstack crabs to count them. We don't have that issue here. We have a five by five meter quadrat. So we basically count crabs along five meters of the, of the, of the shoreline and out to five meters. And from that, we look at female spawning density. Uh, this is for Buzz's Bay. It's an area with very little harvest. We have seen a little decline here compared to earlier years in the survey. It's still a fairly limited time series. It's about a little over 10 years. This is for Cape Cod Bay. We have this one big outlier here in 2013, which we see in other regions too at times. Increasing a little bit recently, but still not what it was. This is the Outer Cape. Uh, this region includes areas that biomedical firms used to harvest. Um, they've seen a little increase here lately. You can get that one big outlier in 2013 again. This is Nantucket Sound. This is where most of the bait harvest is coming from. Uh, basically a straight line, except this one little point up here where it's ticking up. Uh, some of the beaches did not occur in 2020, so I didn't include the 2020 data. Uh, but one of the beaches that was done had its best year in over 10 years, so it's, it's an encouraging sign. Uh, things we're doing for this coming year, a uh, spawning beach survey starts May 9th. Uh, some of you have already volunteered to help with the survey. Thank you very much. I greatly appreciate that. Uh, it starts on Mother's Day this year. Uh, we're collaborating with Conservation Engineering on a training video for the spawning beach survey. Uh, basically, we have 17 beaches now. We're trying to keep everyone on the same page. Uh, so we're putting that out and hopefully put it on our YouTube channel so people can access it while they're out in the survey. Uh, we're updating some maps made by Frank Germano from back in 1999. Uh, the Habitat Project has requested that. And while we're, while, while we're doing that, we're also collecting maturity data. And we're also working with FDI to investigate discard info. And we're going to continue our market sampling. Uh, so to summarize, uh, the Atlantic Horse Crab is not endangered. It's not going extinct. Abundance is generally increasing based on the trawl survey data from up and down the coast. Uh, Biomarker firms are a modest source of mortality. But attention is still needed due to increasing harvest, declining size of individuals, and environmental conditions. And I'd like to thank the many, many, many individuals who've helped with this survey, uh, the Spawning Beach survey, and the many organizations who helped with the survey as well. And with that, I'll take any questions.